Uh, just to let you know, this is going to be a talk in two parts. I'm going to get up and talk about some theory. And then what Leonard is going to do is he is we're going, to, we're going to have an awkward laptop switch where you're all going to talk amongst yourselves. And then Leonard's going to show a demo of what we've done. What I'm going to be talking about is a theory in a library that I built. It's a general purpose library. And I did an implementation for EpiServer. And I'll talk about how we got to this point later on. But Leonard has taken that idea. And over the last year, he has done a really neat Imbraco implementation. So Leonard's going to get up a little bit later and demo that. So Leonard, wave. You'll see Leonard a little bit. Bye bye. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about is the promises and perils of editorial scripting. Um, editorial scripting is exactly what it sounds like. It's if you give your editors the power to do some quasi-pseudo programming and scripting. Um, this is me, by the way. Uh, I don't know why all this is up here. This is not supposed to be here. Hang on. Oh, that looks familiar. OK. So this is the traditional model of development. Editor, de editors use things that developers build. And if editors want some new kind of functionality, they go back to their developers. And the developer builds something new and sends it back to the editor. And the editor is able to use that. So it's a constant cycle between editors and developers. But what if we could kind of break that cycle up? What I want to talk about is the concept of editorial self-determination. Self-determination is an editor being able to decide how their content management implementation plays out, what types of functionality they should have, and should they have any tools or building blocks to build additional functionality. And I was kind of determined to solve this. Um, should editors be able to perform development-like tasks without involving a developer? Should they be able to do things, lightweight kind of development style things, without involving a developer? And I got uh, hooked on the idea of load-bearing walls. I don't know how many new houses you guys build over in Europe. Has anyone here actually built a house from scratch? Not, not you built the house, but you built a new house for you, right? We do this in the United States all the time. When we're like bored, we go and we, we start a new neighborhood and we build a bunch of houses. This is what we do. We have a lot of land in the United States. Um, but I got, I've, I've been hung up on the idea of load-bearing walls, which is where this, uh, this thing comes from. You guys know what a load-bearing wall is, right? It's, the, it's the, the walls in a structure that actually hold the roof up. So if you have a house and you decide that you want to change how your house works, or you're sick of what your house looks like, you can do a lot of things by yourself. You can repaint. You can move your furniture around. Um, you can put new floor coverings down. You may be able to knock down a wall or put a new opening in a wall, but eventually you are going to encounter a load-bearing wall. You're going to encounter a wall that holds the roof of the house up. And if you want to do something about that load-bearing wall, like you want to take it out, you can't do that yourself. Well, you can, but it would probably not turn out well. You need to call a contractor. They need to come in and put up a header and do something interesting for you to be able to do anything with that load-bearing wall. And if you think about CMS implementations, a lot of the success or failure of a CMS implementation over time is driven by where we put the load-bearing walls. It's where we put the things that editors can't change. That really dictates how editors will relate to their CMS implementation over time, whether it works for them, whether it doesn't work for them, and what kind of limitations they have. So I've got an idea about these, this load-bearing wall. And I thought, could we put a situation in where editors might be able to move some load-bearing walls around? If you look at the food chain, and this is a slide, by the way, destined to piss somebody off. So somebody's going to be mad at this slide, but kind of stick with me here. If we look at the food chain of people who affect the CMS implementation, at the top of the food chain, we have server-side developers. We have C-sharp developers that are doing stuff in the back side of the code. And then we have front-end developers. And you can see now why this is going to piss somebody off as we go down this list. And then we have site administrators. And we have what I would call power editors. So site administrators are people who can like, change the configuration of a site. right? from the interface. And then we have power editors. Power editors are you know, those editors that like do everything, and they just have like a ton of power. And then we have what I would say normal editors. These are people who get into the CMS, and they know how to do their one thing. And then we have what I call channeled editors, which are people you don't trust at all. And so you've made them their own little interface. Because <laughs> like, I'm not even going to let you log into the back office. We're going to build this one page thing to have you do the thing you want. And so this is kind of the food chain. And traditionally, the ability to move around load-bearing walls is really concentrated at the top two, maybe the third. right? These are the people who can fundamentally change how a CMS implementation works. And I'm wondering, is there space in here? Is there space in here for someone who's a power editor, a very, very qualified, well-trained editor? Is there a space for them to maybe do something more? And so I came up with this idea of editorial scripting. And I thought, we manage content as content, and we manage code as code. But is there something that we could maybe manage code as content? 
Um, if you look here, the stuff above the line is really content, editorial content, administrative configuration settings, and the stuff below the dashed line is code, things like configuration, like your web config file and your actual templating, your actual server-side development. It's this thing up here, editorial scripting. Can we do something there to allow editors to change the way their CMS functions but manage it as content? Does everything ride, rise to the level of full server-side development or redeploy? If an editor has an idea of something they want to do, does that require someone to crack open Visual Studio, change some code, redeploy, and run through an entire DevOps process? I'm not sure that it does. Are there development tasks that could be done in place? Are there development tasks that an editor could just do if they were well enough trained? I don't know the answer to that. I, I've taken a gamble over the last few years that maybe there is, and, and that's why I'm here talking to you today, but we'll see. Um, some examples of situations where this might play out. One would be one-off content integration. This happens a lot of times where you have uh, a site and you have content types and structures built out for the main pages of that site, but you have this one thing. Like there's this one thing that we do on this one page. Could we maybe do that a different way instead of completely changing our integration to accommodate that? Uh, temporary campaign-based content functionality. Your organization comes to you and says, hey, we're running um, some special involving uh, uh, trips to Moscow and we want to show the temperature in Moscow on this one page. Well, do we need to do C-sharp development to connect to home web service and find out what the current temperature is in Moscow and do a completely redevelopment and rebuild and redeploy for that? Maybe not. Maybe we could just manage that as content. Because it's temporary, right? We're going to run the special for 30 days. So what are we going to do? Pull it out in 30 days and redeploy again? Could we manage this as content? Microservices, so you have a lot of organizations that are opening up service endpoints for various things. Could we integrate those without actually having to do a rig, big rebuild? Intranets, intranets are great for one-off functionality, right? I don't know if anyone's done any intranet work, but an intranet work is really just a collection of hacks. Well, we need to connect to this one service here, and we need to show this value on this one page, and we need to do this over here. And I really think that intranets are really about uh, content aggregation, bringing in content from all sorts of places and presenting them a unified interface. Uh, migration and legacy code, so you're moving a site, and you all know you're moving a site, and then like three weeks before launch, somebody comes to you and says, hey, we forgot to tell you about this one thing. And then you go back and look at that one thing, and you're like, crap, well, how's this going to fit in? Well, maybe you don't need to build that in, right? This is legacy code. It's going to go away eventually. Maybe you could bring that functionality into your new site a different way rather than building it all into the core. Uh, prototyping, maybe you're just sitting around. You want to try something out. But again, we don't want to do a big redeploy for this. You just want to kind of try it out in place. And then finally, what user indecision. I've seen this all the time. You know, it's four weeks away from launch, and the client can't decide what they want to do. And you're like, OK, well, we're going to move on from a development standpoint. We're just going to move past this, and we're going to integrate this as editorial scripting and maybe come back. And if, if it's something you decide you want to keep, or if it's something that you forget about, and you will probably forget about it because that's what our customers do, um, we'll just pull it out later. So these are examples of where you might do it. And so when I looked for editorial scripting, I looked around and said, what are kind of people doing in this space? And I was really driven by a company called MindTouch. I don't even know if they're still around. But for a long time, they made kind of a wiki, internal internet wiki type system. And they had what they called DeciScript. And this was the only screen cap I could find in it. And you can see DeciScript here. So inside their WYSIWYG editor, you could have a block of what they called DeciScript. And it was actually a full-blown like Turing complete scripting language which is way more than I needed. But I was really encouraged by this because I talked to some customers of MindTouch that were doing some enormously wonderful things with this. They would have executable scripts right there inside their WYSIWYG editor that would then execute as it rendered on the page and do some really neat things. It was impressive. Um, I, I wrote a long post four years ago, uh, editorial scripting and CMS. You can go read that if you want. But I asked these questions like, could we do this? Is this the next step for editors is to provide some scripting capabilities? And here's the kind of path I took. My original, the original problem that I was presented with was what I called editorial file inclusion. We all know what server-side includes are, right? We've been using that for years. That's when you take the content of one file and you include it in another one just before you send it out the door. Well, I thought, what if editors could do that? What if they had a file of content on the file system? Could they include that in editorial content? So I came up with this system, and I built this little thing where this was in EpiServer. And, and again, Leonard's going to show us the Embraco version. But I, I built this system in EpiServer where they could specify a file, and it would read the contents of this file in and just kind of write it to the buffer. So they could have a situation where they have a front-end developer that was doing some like hardcore front-end development, and then they could just read that HTML file off the file script. And, and that was great, and it worked really good. But then questions then arose about the vari variability of file contents. Well, how do they know what's in that file? 
Is it HTML ready to roll? Or is it just text that maybe they need to add line breaks to? Or is it markdown that needs to be processed? And so all of these things came up where I'm like, well, how do you account for that? You know, I suppose we could look at the file extension. How do we know what's in the file? And do we need to post-process that file after we read it in? And so I came to this, <laughs> this, this functionality to enable text processing. So I went off the file extension. If the file extension was .html, we just dumped it. If it was .txt, I added line breaks. If it was .md, I marked it, processed it in markdown. But I could see at that point kind of where this was going. And then questions arose about where the files could be located. I was concentrated in reading files off the file system, but what if they were stored in a database? Could we read them out of a database? What if they were remote? Could we read them over a web service? And so that's when I realized kind of where this was going. Um, and one thing kind of led to another, and, and, and this is where I ended up. Um, I looked at a lot of different options before I settled on what I'm going to show you. I actually looked at dynamically compiled C Sharp, which was just a massive, massive mistake. Um, I looked at Iron Python. I don't know if anyone's worked with that, but it's Python that runs inside a C Sharp sandbox. I looked at Script Engine, which is the JavaScript engine in C Sharp. And then I looked at Jurassic, which is Google V8 ported to a C Sharp execution environment. And I, I used, I implemented all of these, but they were all just way too far. Right? There's no way editors were going to get this. You had to variable scoping and function. There was just no way it was going to work. And so what I came up with, I realized I really just needed a text processing pipeline. That's what I needed. I need the ability to acquire text somewhere, process that text through a series of stages, and then output that text. And so really, almost all scripting tasks involve the output of text. They really involve the output of markup. An editor has markup in one place, and they want to funnel that markup through a pipeline, and they want to get it out to the buffer. And the metaphor of pipeline is really easy to grasp. I found that editors really understand this idea of a pipeline. You're going to acquire text content somewhere. You're going to process it through multiple steps. And then you're going to push it out to uh, your content consumer. Successively refining text by piping it from a command to command has significant history. If anyone has worked on Unix, I mean the bash shell. You can pipe commands from one to another. That's kind of a thing that we do in computing. And here's an example of kind of what a pipeline might look like. You're going to read text in from somewhere. You're going to process, it's raw markdown, so you're going to turn it into HTML. You're going to replace some tokens. There might be some special tokens in there you replace. You're going to correct some image paths, and then you're going to output it. So this is this idea of a pipeline. It kind of becomes an assembly line. You get text, you progressively refine it, and then you push it out. So Danina uh, is the name of the scripting language that I have built. It is not a programming language. It's really not a Turing complete language. You're not going to find loops or anything like that in it. It's really what I would call a text inclusion engine. Um, it's read and output only. You're, you're not going to, all you want to do is get information out to the people that are consuming your content. This is not going to let you like administrate a database or something like that. And it uses a pipeline metaphor for obtaining, transforming, and finally outputting text. Transformations are called filters, so you're going to acquire text and you're going to filter it over time. And scripts are edited inside the CMS. So this is the idea. What you do is you're going to obtain some text, you're going to transform it iteratively. So every step in the pipeline is going to transform that text. The next step is then going to work off what was transformed in the last step, and so on and so on and so on, until you're finally going to output it. Here are some examples. This is in EpiServer. This is EpiServer's demo site, and this is what I originally built this for. Um, and I'm going to show you, this is a video, and I'm going to show you uh, using Danina in EpiServer. And I'm going to kind of narrate this as it goes by. Well, hold on. This is a video. should be. Yes. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a block in EpiServer, and I want a block for my Goodreads list. And I'm putting some commands. We'll go over commands later. But these are the commands. I'm putting in a template and some CSS. And then I'm going to hit Create. And when that executes on render, it's going to list all of my Goodreads books. So what this is, is this is an editor having some scripting capability to do something like this, where normally to do something like this, they would have to go to a developer, and a developer would have to write some C Sharp to do that. Um, just to give you a look, uh, the commands there are at the top. In this case, we have three, four commands. Yes. So what we're doing is we're, uh, we're taking a URL uh, to the Goodreads API. We're adding a query string for a Goodreads API key. We're making the get call. And then down the bottom, we're getting back, and we have a command to format the nodes. The template is in the middle. You don't have to use the template there. It's optional. And uh, we're creating some HTML. And then we had some scope. This CSS used to be scoped. It used the scoped keyword, which actually got deprecated. So actually, I'm just dumping this in an inline style tag, which I shouldn't be doing, but that's what I am. Um, 
It's built on the concept of commands, and I'm going to give you an example of what a, a script might look like. In this case, we have a command called file.read. We're reading a file off the file system. The file is called mycontent.txt, and you can sandbox this to a particular location. You can say, if anybody does a file.read, this is the only directory they can read from. So like they can't read your web config or something like that. And then we're transforming this. We have a, a text.format lines. All we're doing is adding a line break to the end of the line there. And html.wrap, we're wrapping this in a div tag, and we're putting a class on it. And then we're outputting it. Output is always implied. Whatever is delivered from the last step in a Danina script gets output. So starting with a pound sign there, that's a comment. Um, but output is always implied. Whatever comes out of the last step goes out. So that's an example, very simply, of we're reading a file off the file system, adding some new lines, wrapping it into div, and we're pushing it out. Here's another example. We are actually making an HTTP call here. We're um, calling Gadgetopia's RSS feed. So we've now read that in. And we have XML.format nodes, so we're doing an XPath of items, so we're getting the individual items, and we're putting the, the title of those items in a um, list item. Then we're wrapping that in an unordered list, Whoop. and then we would output. So the end of that would be output. So what we're doing is we're taking the RSS feed from Gadgetopia, we're turning it into a bulleted list, and we're putting it out. Uh, there's another example. This is from Episerver. Clearly, we're actually reading content properties off this. We're reading the city name. So we're assuming on our page we have a field for city name. And in this particular case, uh, somebody wants to include the weather from a particular city. So there's a field on that piece of content where they can put Moscow or whatever. And then we're also reading a co content property from the start page. This is a very common convention in Episerver that you put global properties on the start page. We're reading in the API key. So this would be our Open Weather Maps API key. And we're storing those in variables. You see the uh, arrow on the end there? That means take the result of this uh, operation and put it in a variable. Keep it there. And then what we're doing is we are uh, taking the Open Weather Map API. We're adding two query string arguments. We're putting the name of the city, which we read in from the content property. And we're putting the API key, which we read in from the start page. And then we're making a get call for that. And then we're taking the result, and we're extracting out the temperature. And we're putting that in a variable called temp. And then what we're doing is formatting the output. Uh, we're saying the temp in whatever city you were using is 43 degrees or whatever. We're wrapping that in a paragraph tag. And the last step, that goes out. So this is an editor who has been able to connect to a secure web service, process the result, and output it without doing any server-side development. I did some SQL. Uh, you might look at this and say, my god, this is horrible, uh, letting them do SQL. But I, I maintain, if you don't understand SQL Server, if you understand SQL Server permissions, you would be less concerned. Clearly, if you do this, you're going to give them a connection string that's safe. It's read-only. It only has access to certain tables and certain columns. You're not going to give them an SA account on your SQL Server. But here's an example. I mean, I'm just selecting star from contacts. Uh, hold on. Here's an example. So we're selecting star from contacts, ordering by date added, descend, descending. And this is using the for XML auto option in SQL Server. So it's delivering back an XML document. What we're doing is we're going to count those nodes. We're going to figure out, we're going to pipe to a variable called count how many nodes there. We're going to extract the most recent one. And then we're going to wrap that in uh, a sentence. There are X number of contacts in the database. The most recently added is, is whatever. And so here's a situation where someone's able to connect to database, do a simple query, and output the results. Uh, this is a little more. So in Episerver, we're actually reading files off Episerver file system. So in this particular case, we can add a SQL query as a text file attached to content. And we can add an XSLT template to that. So we're reading those both in from the CMS. If either are empty, we're aborting. Uh, see the slash label end. It goes to a certain label. And end is the end of the script. And then we are doing the transformation and outputting the result. Uh, this is an interesting example here that I did with Danita at one point. You can do some neat proxy stuff to bring in external information. If you have a situation where you have uh, another content system running, was anyone in my distributed CMS talk yesterday? OK, so this is like distributed CMS jam, right? You have another entire content system running somewhere else. And how can we bring that into our current system? I'm trying to remember which is which. OK, the one on the left is Danina is running. And what it's doing is it's calling over to uh, Gadgetopia. And it's running a search there. And it's getting back the search results page. And then it's lifting out the contents of the search result page and putting it where the Danina script was. So in this particular case, we're calling HTTP.proxy. 
And what that command does is it takes the inbound request, it duplicates it, changes the URL, and sends it backwards to the other system. And in this case, we're uh, taking the request, we're changing the URL, and we are retaining an S parameter, and then we're sending it back to a WordPress implementation. It's executing that in the WordPress implementation. We're getting that uh, search results page back, and we're lifting out the contents of it. So we're lifting out um, the div with an ID of main and a class of container, and then what we're doing is we're just dumping that to the page. So essentially, we are remote controlling a WordPress implementation, in this case, from an EpiServer site. Um, we have the idea of command factories. What you can do is you can alias commands. So the CRM database.get contacts, when this runs, when your editors type this in there, um, what this does is this actually, you can alias this behind the scenes, so it becomes a much longer command. And so what you can do is you can create editor-friendly command sets that your editors understand. They're like, I know my CRM database, and I know what contacts are, and I can put a where clause in there, and I get that. But they don't have to worry about things like connection strings and the entire SQL string. Uh, you can do file includes that way, as, uh, that way as well, too. What you could do is you could have a set of Danina commands that are on the file system that you would write, and this is where you get into kind of quasi-fuzzy development. So you as a developer would write because you understand it, and then your editors can actually just include that. They can include a set of commands from somewhere else. Uh, it's very, very extensible. In this particular case, uh, what Leonard's going to show you here is you can actually write templates inside the CMS, and then that gets injected as a variable. And in this case, we've written this little mini template in yellow. It gets injected to our script in a variable, which we can access in our script so that you don't have to write your entire template in line. Uh, you can have predefined variables. You can put variables in your web config that are available to all scripts. In this case, we don't want anyone to really know what our Goodreads API key is, but we want that to be available for editors to include in our scripts. So you can put those in your web config, and then editors can refer to that. Uh, have some error handling. What we can do is if, if the script does throw an error, how do we want to handle that? We can either display error content. We can just hide it and pretend that nothing ever happened. We can throw an exception, which you wouldn't want to do that unless you're in like a development environment. We can output some detailed debug info, so when you're de debugging these things. Or we can output a hidden error message. You can output the error message as an HTML comment so nobody can see it, but you can go in and see what actually happened. Uh, we can cache. If the cache is zero, it'll run that script every single time. Uh, if you set the, script, the cache to 60 minutes, that script will cache its result and not rerun the script for 60 minutes. The cache key is a hash of the entire command set. If anybody ch changes a command, uh, it'll invalidate the cache. But if you want this thing to only run once an hour, you can do that. And it's very, very extensible. Danina scripts really just map to C-sharp functions. And here's an example. If we wanted to create a filter for text.prepend, all that is is down the bottom there, that's that function. Uh, it outputs a string, it takes an input and the command, and then it returns a value. So you can create a function and register a new command very, very easily. These functions could be specific to your organization, specific to your scenario, uh, specific to your editors, and you can alias them as Danina commands to give your editors the power to work with those. Uh, there is a 12,000 words of documentation I have written in a GitHub wiki. If you go to denina.org, D-E-N-I-N-A.org, it will link to the GitHub wiki. Uh, the entire system is self-documented as well. All of the commands, all of their arguments, all of their help text is actually compiled in as attributes. And what Leonard's going to show you is he is uh, automatically generating a UI for editors. The, the text version I've shown you, Leonard's done something even cooler where he's auto-generating uh, a UI for editors, and he's generating that by reflecting the DLL because all of the commands are actually built in the, in the DLL. I wrote 12,000 words of documentation, uh, which shows you, I, first of all, I have no social life whatsoever. Um, I have a lot of time in my hands. And um, I, I'm very, very passionate about this. So uh, it's all out on GitHub. It's an open source project. The library is called Danina Sharp. And then there are implementations for different CMSs. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit just briefly before Leonard comes up about how we got to this point. I've been working on this for four years. For about three years, I've had an EpiServer implementation. And we do have a few deployments for it. But it never really took off at the EpiServer community. I've pre presented about this at two EpiServer events. But it just it never quite latched on with that community. And uh, I love EpiServer CMS, and I love the EpiServer community. But they are very, very commercially focused, and it just, it just never really took off. And this is my third year speaking at uh, Code Garden. And the first year I was here in 2017. Uh, I was here for a day. And I just got a feeling about this group of people. And I got a feeling about the Embraco developer community that you guys were hackers. And then these were people that maybe this could latch on with. 
And so last year when I came out, I came out with the express purpose of finding someone to implement this into Umbraco. And at the pre-party, uh, I know a guy named Paul Demeter. He's from uh, Amsterdam. And uh, he introduced me to one of his developers, a guy named Leonard. And I thought, Leonard, you're my guy. You're going to do this. So I told him about this, and I gave him a URL. And I thought, Leonard, I'll talk to you about this later, but this is the thing I'm going to have you do. And I was totally jet lagged, and so I went back to my hotel and I fell asleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I had an email from Leonard, and he had done it. He sent me screen caps, and it was running. I believe everything he wrote that night he has thrown away since then. Yeah, okay, so he wrote a prototype and he sent it. And I was like, Leonard, you're my guy. Clearly, I was right about you. You're my guy. And so uh, I've been bothering Leonard on and off for the last year, but then about two months ago, he sent me a screen cap of what he had done to show me like the UI he had put together, and it was just really phenomenal. And so I said, okay, I'm already coming out for Code Garden 19. I'm going to see if I can get an extra session so you and I can get up here and talk about this. And so I wrote uh, the conference organizer, Ilum, at, at Umbraco, and I wrote Niels, and I said, hey, can I get another session? And they said, well, you know, we have a lot of technical sessions. I don't know if we can fit you in on that side. And I said, okay, but just let me pitch you. And they're like, okay. So the next day, I wrote this super long email to Niels. And uh, is it Ilum? Is, is it right? Okay, right. So I wrote them this super long email. And this was a long-ass email. This was like 2,000 words of email. Because I had to explain like, what this was from the beginning. And if you've ever read my blog post, you will know that 2,000 words is like dropping. That's like a Tuesday for me, right? So... <laughs> It was like 2,000 word email, and it was like all these links and the whole history of the project and links to these blog posts and links to video, and it was really making my case. And I sent it off, I'm like, Whew, that's great. And I thought, I'm not going to hear about this for days. This is going to take them like forever to like absorb this information and like figure this out. And so I'm like, okay, it's going to take days, I'll get an answer. It took nine minutes. <laughs> Niels, were, I timed it. I checked the, Niels wrote about nine minutes, and he was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And he was like dropping F-bombs, and he's like, this is the like greatest thing I've ever seen. And I wrote him back, and I said, that was the greatest email response I ever got in my entire life. And so, and so here we are. So we got this extra session, and uh, Leonard's been working overtime for the last two months to kind of put this together. And uh, so I'm really excited about this. I think the Embraco community could really use this and latch on to this, and maybe we could start something with this. I think this is a new paradigm of CMS implementation. It's a new paradigm of the way editors might interact with their CMS, and I'm really excited about what Leonard's done. So I'm going to stop talking, and we're going to have the awkward laptop change. So for about one minute, talk amongst yourselves, and then Leonard's going to show you what he's done. Uh, thank you, Dean, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to redo a little bit. Uh, Unfortunately, Dean spoiled a few of my surprises already. So um, I'm, I'm please act surprised when you see it, please. So um, my name is Leonard van Tijn. Uh, I'm a senior .NET developer at Arlenet. Um, been using Umbraco since version four or something. Uh, did a little bit of epi server here and there. It's not my core business. Um, I can understand that my name is a little bit hard to understand. So I figured I should just turn it into something Umbrakians understand. So. If you have a hard time expressing my name, Leonard Fontaine is fine as well. Um, besides uh, Arlenet, I'm also a lecturer at the uh, University of, uh, of Applied Sciences in Amsterdam. Uh, was already said before. On top of that, I'm also a game developer, uh, say my professional in whatever time I have left. And apparently, I'm also a math scientist because I also had time to do this in my spare time beside things. Um, so uh, with all due respect, Dean, uh, it's a cool project. Uh, I really enjoy working, uh, working on it. Um, so yeah, uh, Dean basically already did a little bit of the introduction. But I met Dean last year at Code Garden here. Uh, and we hit off right away. So as you said, uh, the, the same evening, uh, I already got something up and running in Umbraco. And it really got me excited about the opportunities that were ahead of this. Uh, but I also was uh, intrigued by his passion with the Nina. So as he said, Von, I'm really passionate about this thing. I really noticed that during the first conversations I had with him. So I really had this feeling that I wanted to con contribute to whatever he was doing with this. So um, slight warning, um, I'm actually going to show you some code. So uh, don't be afraid. Might be a little bit ugly here and there, um, but I want you. So what did I end up making? Uh, well, this is the thing Dean already spoiled, but uh, basically Dean's thing is a script-based version, and we know that scripting in its own is not really the easiest thing. It takes a lot of reading. Uh, 
also uh, seen by how much documentation you had to write to actually make it something usable. Uh, scripting is hard, um, even for a programmer. Uh, so I did what all Umbrekins would do, and that's uh, slap a UI on it. Um, so how did I manage to do that? And this is another thing Dean already spoiled for me, but there's a lot of documentation in the Nina shop already, so I used a reflection. Um, because we can, and reflection is cool, and you should use it, but uh, in all seriousness, it was already there, uh, done by Dean and all. Um, so how does that look inside the code? Well, that's something like this. So he already showed you one of the filters uh, a while back. Um, but there's a lot of metadata tags on top of those annotations, attributes, however you want to call them. And um, as nice as Dean uh, is, he also turned this into a automatic documentation generator. So I could just basically hook into his code and pull out whatever information I wanted to know about all the cool filters that are actually inside the Nina Sharp. So why did we want to do this? And Dean already uh, reflected on this a little. Uh, but where I saw the uh, opportunities in this is that because this could really become a sort of prototyping uh, tool for developers. So Embraco is all about UI, making it easy to develop something, add something cool uh, to Embraco, and give it to your clients. Uh, but one of the things that you constantly run into is that if, an, if a client needs, for example, some sort of API call somewhere, you have, to, you have to spin up Visual Studio, you have to do the HTTP client request, you have, you have a lot of boilerplate going on before you can actually get to something working and show it to your clients. Whereas with this, I could do it with five lines of code and it was done and I could actually show my client, hey, this, is this what you want? Is this how you want to look? Oh, no, you, you really wanted this in color green? Okay, fine, I'm going to change it to green. And I could real, in, in real time, I can show my client what I'm doing before I actually start implementing it the proper way and usually inside the framework, whatever I'm working on. So it's fun. Uh, it's because the possibilities are infinite. Um, and you can imagine that there are a lot of possibilities in there. So without further ado, I'm going to show you, actually show you something. So let's switch back to the project. I already spun it up. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it supports both Umbraco 7 and Umbraco 8. Uh, my Umbraco 7 version is a little bit better, so I'm, that's why I'm demoing this one right now. Uh, but I can show the uh, V8 version in a second as well. So what did I do? I added a new property editor to Umbraco in this case and basically implemented a UI on top of the grid edit, uh, or on top of the comments. So instead of having to actually write a line of code to tell the, the Nina Sharp whatever it has to do, you can just go to add a comment, scroll down the list, basically abusing the documentation system that's inside of the Nina Sharp, pick whatever comment you want, fill in whatever it wants you to fill in, submit, and there's pretty much Nothing you can, can do wrong in here. The required fields are required, so it actually enforces that as well. So if you did something wrong, it stops you from doing something wrong. And once you're there, you can actually just go ahead and immediately preview whatever you're doing in there. So this doesn't take any saving or publishing. You can go, go right ahead and tweak this immediately. So I'm going to do an in-depth demo in a moment. This is just a broad overview. For example, if, I, if the client says, okay, but I don't like that orange color. No, 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 I really like it uh, blue instead. So you can just go there, type blue, preview, and it's blue. So really, qu really quickly you can iterate on doing whatever you want. So I can really imagine that when you have this as a tool set, so in this case it's a property editor, but I'm really seeing possibilities for basically having a custom section where you can add, for example, reusable blocks, reusable command blocks. Um, where you can just go with your client, integrate whatever you want to integrate with them, basically take them into the process of what it takes to do that sort of thing, show them what they want, before you actually start doing the hard, code, the hard part where you actually write the, good, the, good, the, the proper code for it. So I'm going to uh, do a small example. So this is one, and I'm going to do this one um, from the start. So already made a test page, and I added, uh, just to be sure, it actually worked before I started uh, coming up on the stage, but I'm going to clear this one. 
And as you can see, I try to mimic as much of the uh, available uh, things that are in Umbraco already. So I'm trying to somewhat mimic the, the, the look and feel of the grid editor currently, the, the same s stylish icons, uh, the, the same styles here and there. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take my demo sheet, that's, uh, which I obviously prepared, and I'm going to uh, grab the latest article that uh, Dean has published on his website, which is uh, Gadgetopia. So in this case, it's uh, going to be towards a content modeling standard. And this could be a use case where a client says, hey, I have something on a website. Uh, we don't actually have an API. We also don't have the money to have an API for it. But we do want to have these three top three articles on our web page. Um, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to not do a for each loop right now in the template as such. But I'm going to grab the first article that's on there, grab the title, grab the description, and show it inside one of the, the Nina Sharp blocks. So as a developer, you would know you start up the inspector, you pick up the elements, you figure out where the paths are, and you basically start doing what you would do when you start programming. For an editor, this is obviously slightly harder to do. So it would take an editor that has at least a little bit of experience with web and how things work. So um, I'm, I'm leaning more towards that this is going to be a developer tool rather than an editorial tool, but I also see the possibilities that Dean has proposed for giving editors much more power if they're um, going towards that power or if, if they have the knowledge to use that power, that power properly. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to grab a HTTP request, drop down, going to throw this one in here, URL. And as I go, I can actually set a command as well. So I can just go say, uh, grab the front page, hit submit, and it's there. First command is done. When I do this, review, I get the full website in there right now. Probably not the best because I've broken Braco right now. So I'm going to actually save this and redo it if it still works. So you will probably want to iframe this, but. Oh, now I did it again. So um, once you have this, um, what, what, what happens in the Nina Sharp is it's, it stores this result uh, on top of a stack. So it's basically one variable for everything, which is the output variable. So right now, the output variable of the Nina Sharp is the website. But we want to actually grab a few, of, few things out of this output. So what we have to do is, like we would do in programming, we have to store the output in a variable so we can reuse that variable a few times to actually extract the information we want from it. So in this case, I'm going to go back to this one. And I'm going to say, OK, I want to store this in an output variable, just turn this into a dollar sign website. It doesn't have to be a dollar sign. I just like doing it. And actually, I'm going to remove it. but. So dollar sign, save it, nothing else happens. Output variable is cleared because I redirected the output. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to extract something. So before we can actually do that, I have to know what I'm going to extract. So I'm going to extract the title. So right click, inspect, figure out hey, there's an H2 class with an, uh, an article title on it. And if I look forward, uh, there's a article date. And there's actually a, a, a paragraph tag here with some text in it. So uh, I'm going to use that information in order to actually extract some information from this website. So I'm going to go back, going down the page, I'm going to say, which one did I do again? I'm actually going to HTML extract, obviously. So I'm going to do HTML extract going to say that the input variable I want to use in this case is website, because that's where I store my information. And now I'm just going to cheat and grab this one here. So I'm going to put this one in there, submit. And when I preview right now, I'm going to grab the title. Um, oh, wait, I didn't save this one. I'll put websites. There you go, so title. I have to do this two more times. So uh, I also added a copy-paste mechanism, so I can just copy-paste this twice and then adjust accordingly. So article date. 
I actually noticed that we're running out of time, so I'm going to cut this short in a moment. Oh. I'm clicking like crazy right now. Stop it. Article dates and the last one. This one was a little bit harder because I had to grab the third paragraph in the thing because Dean doesn't have any classes on his paragraphs. Hint, hint. There we go. So because I have three of these now, I also have to redirect these three into a variable so I can actually use them inside the template that I want to use in this case. Because if I do this now, it's also going to grab the last one because there's only one final output in here. So I'm going to redirect this one into title, obviously. This one into date. And I'm going to redirect this one into description. So now when I preview, everything is blank again because there's no output. And now I'm just going to grab a small template that we made. Oh, those are the dev tools, this one. Drop it into template. And as you can see, this is a little thing with angle sharp. So there's actually also in a, a small uh, for each if statements, that kind of thing in there. But in this case, there's the, the magic fars variable that has all the variables that you actually defined in your small code up there. So right now, when I put preview, nothing is happening. Oh, and that's correct, because I also have to tell Danina in this case that it actually has to use the template. And in this case, as the description says, it actually makes it a variable for you called template, which you can use. So I can just add the last command, tell it to text, template from text, and tell it to use web um, template. as a command. And in this case, when I preview, you have to actually, in this case, you have to do put a dollar sign in front of it because you're actually referencing a variable. And there we go. Now we have a output on our variable. And in this case, I can also style it. So I'm, again, just going to copy paste here in terms of time. Drop it in there. Hit preview. And there we go. Now we have grabbed the, the last article on his page. Go to <laughs> so as you can see, it takes a little getting used to, but once you know one of the main few commands that you're going to use a lot, you can actually very quickly reiterate on this. And if we go to the page itself right now, there it is. So um, I really think this is a really cool system, so I'm just going to switch back to my PowerPoint real quickly because there are a few additional slides. Uh, I'm really seeing a lot of possibilities in this, uh, both from a developer experience as well as a potential editorial experience. Uh, we can go a long way with standard commands, uh, configurable permissions in Umbraco, reusable blocks, that sort of thing. Uh, on top of that, the, the whole code base is available on GitHub uh, right now. I'll show a link in a moment. And um, there's also a good showcase, in my opinion, about how you can actually have one code base, plugin-wise, both JavaScript and everything, which deploys to both v V7 and V8. Um, it's also using a lot of the out-of-the-box stuff in Umbraco, some of which maybe you don't even know exists, but there's a lot of cool things in there. So really check it out. Uh, for the roadmap, um, thank you, Umbraco HQ, because I could really steal your uh, format in here uh, right now. I'm going to wrap up some loose ends uh, in here because as these days approach, I actually ran into a few things that I wanted to wrap up. For example, there's also a grid version in here which works, so I can also already drop the Nina Sharp in a grid as well and render it out. So the V7 part is complete. But I also want to do that in V8, but I didn't really test that yet. Uh, I want to deploy some new get packages so you can quickly get this up and running. Uh, and I already got the Umbraco package page in draft, so I just have to finish that one. Uh, next up is uh, something, some things I also have to discuss with Dean, but it's the separation of the filters that are in the Nina Sharp right now. They are all part of a single DLL, uh, some of which you don't always want. So I really want to extract the core part of the Nina from whatever filters it has. So you can basically pick your flavor. Uh, and some even better exception handling for really debugging, de debugging purposes where you can 
really point out from, hey, I did something wrong on this command on this line for this reason. And that's something that's missing in the core of the Nina Sharp right now. And later on, uh, the Nina Sharp uh, is going to go to .NET Core standard. Uh, and that's mostly because it's already 99% compatible. So it's a shame not to do that immediately. Um, and I want to determine where we're going to take things with this. So we need you for that. Uh, everything you saw right now is available already at my GitHub. Um, for convenience, I also posted a tiny URL, so you only have to remember the Nina Sharp. Um, what do we need from you? Um, well, I would really like to know use cases people have for this. So come to us with use cases. What are you intending to use this for? Why do you want to use it? And maybe we can figure out something to actually make this even better than it already is, in my opinion. Um, please report issues, make pull requests. Uh, please help us collaborate and make this a really great thing. Uh, also to share the same passion uh, the need, uh, uh, Dean has for, for it as well as I. Um, and discuss where things are going. So thank you for your attention and uh, hope to speak to you soon. If you're in a situation where you think this might work for a project or work for a client, I would love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very, very passionate about this, just both from a practical standpoint, but I think it's an opportunity for us to, this is gonna sound dramatic, but maybe redefine how editors relate to a CMS. I think this is an, ex an example of where the Embraco community could really pick this up and we could really chart a new course for how editors and developers interact and how CMS implementations come about. So if you see a place where you might be able to use this and get some value out of it, please get in touch with me. Please get in touch with Leonard. I would love to talk to you about it and help you make that happen. So thank you very much. You're my man. <laughs>